Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on in our taking, I've been taking a look at what we as Christians, what our behavior should be, and our behavior is determined by our attitude. So we're looking at the behavior and the attitudes. And uh, in the last couple of weeks, we looked at, from the Sermon on the Mount, we looked at, blessed are the merciful, right? For they shall receive mercy. So we're going to start a new one today. But first, I will ask the Lord's blessing on our time together and on the teaching of the Word. Because, Father, your Word is so important in our lives, Lord God. Your Word is what brings faith into our lives, faith into our hearts, faith into our mouth, Lord God. And without that faith, it's impossible to please you. And it's our desire to be pleasing to you, to be approved by you, Lord. So help us, Lord God, just to soak in your word, to love your word. Like Jeremiah, he said, thy word was found and I ate it. It became for me the joy and delight of my heart. May that be the case for us, Lord God. And Lord, may you put a guard over my mouth. that nothing would come out of my mouth that you have not put into my heart. So we praise you and thank you for your son, Christ Jesus, who indeed was the word made flesh. Hallelujah. So speaking of Jesus, when Jesus, after he was baptized, he went into the wilderness. And there he was tempted by the devil. I, I think you all know this account, right? In Matthew chapter 7. And it says, after he'd been in the wilderness and tempted by the devil, he came out and he began to preach. And what he began to preach was repentance. Well, the Greek word that is used there for repentance, and pretty much continually throughout this, the New Testament, it's a metanoeo, and it means to change one's mind. To change one's mind means to think differently, and therefore to behave differently. Or as the Apostle Paul would say, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, in Romans 12 too. That's what repentance is about. I mean, so often we think that repentance is no more than saying, well, I'm sorry. Well, the fact of the matter is you can be sorry. You can say you're sorry without being repentant at all. Because repentance is dependent on a change of heart. Right? And that change of heart changes our mind and changes what we do. It'll change our attitude and it'll change our behavior. So when Jesus came out of the wilderness, he went into a synagogue in Nazareth. And he read from the prophet Isaiah. And what he read from the prophet Isaiah, what he had written, and it said, I'm reading from Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them who are oppressed, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord to the poor, to the captives, to those who are oppressed. Well, as God had sent Moses into Egypt to set his people free, when they were harshly treated and oppressed by the taskmasters there in Egypt, he's now, he has now sent his son Christ Jesus once again to set men free. This time, hallelujah, forever. In the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus was training his disciples in righteousness and preparing them to go forth into the world, Jesus warned them against the terrible taskmaster, Mammon. He said, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the, others, the other. You cannot serve God and Mammon. Well, Matthew 6, 24. God is our master. Satan wants to be. I mean, it's that simple. The desire for riches, having, having an abundance of things in the world, that's the enemy's big gun. I, I really believe that. You see, because when, he was, when Jesus was being tempted out in the wilderness and all else had failed, the devil said, where it says in Matthew 4, 8, and 9, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, 
All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Satan wants us to worship him. He wants to be our master. Well, that didn't work against Jesus. And I pray that it won't work against us because it's either one or the other. You know, it's like Joshua coming out of the wilderness saying to the people, choose you this day whom you will serve. It's like Elijah going up the mountain on Carmel when the people had been rebellious and saying, you know, you've got to decide who you're going to serve. You've got to decide who you think God is, who the Lord is. It's got to be one or the other. And remember, the Apostle John wrote in his first letter and said, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If Satan can get you to love the things of the world, guess what? The love of the Father won't be in you. And that leads us back to the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, the behavior and the attitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 3. The poor in spirit. You have to first of all consider the fact that Jesus chose this to be the opening statement of the Sermon on the Mount. It is not an accident or just random. The statement is foundational to receiving and understanding the entire teaching of Jesus. As you know, this is what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. But all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. 1 Corinthians 14.33 and verse 40. God is not a God of confusion. He is a God of good order. Here then, we need to start sharing the same understanding of what poor means. Okay? We're going to talk about being poor. We've got to have the same understanding of what poor is. And believe me, most people don't have the same understanding. Right? So let me go back to one of my favorite books. Not my favorite book. The dictionary. Because the dictionary says this. Poor is having little or no money, goods, or other means of support. It means to be dependent upon charity or public support. It means to be meagerly supplied or endowed with resources or funds. And it's characterized by showing poverty. Characterized by, okay, poverty and, and poor, okay? Being rich or living in poverty is demonstrated by a behavior and controlled by attitude. Whether, you're, whether you act rich or poor, it exposes the heart for better or for worse. You know, I had an acquaintance a number of years ago. He was a multi, multi millionaire down in South Florida when Alice and I lived there and I had a business down there. He asked if I would go with him to his office in California to help sort out a problem that he was having. So as we were flying across country, uh, in one of his private jets, we were having a conversation on our way back to him, back and forth. And he kept talking about the deals that he had lost that would have made him a billionaire. I mean, the man was it's just incredibly wealthy, right? But he, all he talked about was how he didn't make this deal for a billion and didn't make that deal. He wasn't content with the amazing abundance that he had. And it reminded me of what Solomon wrote. This is from Proverbs 30, 15. The leech has two daughters. Give, give. There are three things that will not be satisfied. Four that will not say enough. He was living in poverty. He was living in poverty. Because with all of his wealth, and he had a phenomenal amount of wealth, all that consumed his mind was what he didn't have. Being rich Truly being rich is about having a father who owns everything. That's why Paul the Apostle could say, and my God will supply all of your needs through his riches, his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. We are dependent. We are dependent on his riches, not our own. And if that's not the case in your life, it's time to examine what's in your heart and perhaps repent. Change your mind. I can have no riches or wealth, and at the same time have no concern about needs. Like Paul, I've learned the secret of being full and going hungry. So what, what do you desire? That's the question. What, what do you desire? 
what's really the desire of your heart. Can we say, as it says in the Psalms, whom have I in heaven but you? And beside you, I desire nothing on earth. That's Psalm 73, verse 25. That, God's written his word on the tablets of our heart. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That should be our confession. We desire nothing but the Lord. He'll take care of every need that we have. You see, the poor are dependent, totally dependent. Being poor by its very nature, nature means that one is unable to meet his or her own needs. Right? If you're poor, you can't meet your needs. That's what, that's what the basic of the definition is. Being poor in spirit is about our, our recognizing our dependence on the Lord. Being poor in spirit, now listen to this, being poor in spirit is about the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our life. It's about our reliance on Him which starts with the free gift of salvation, paid for by his shed blood on the cross, and then for everything else that we need. There was no way we could obtain salvation. We couldn't buy salvation. You can't. The only thing it took was the blood of Jesus Christ, and that was his free gift. Being rich or being poor in the spirit is about being set free from the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, because Jesus said, that that will choke the word and make it unfruitful in our lives. Go to Matthew 13 and check it out. The sower and the seed. So depending on the Lord will protect us from falling into the trap of pride, which is the gateway to all sin, as can be seen in the following verses. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 6, 18, 16, 18, rather. Solomon, with his God-given wisdom, said, There are six things which the Lord hates, yea, even seven which are an abomination to him. Proverbs 6.16. What's the first one? Haughty eyes. Pride. That's the very first of those six or seven things. And then Paul wrote to Timothy, describing the failings and the falling of the so-called the compromised church and mankind in general, and of the last perilous days, starting by saying, for men will be lovers of self. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3. And the second item in that list is the love of money. See, when I've, I've known a lot of wealthy people in my life. And to say that it's extremely rare is an understatement for me to tell you about the rich people I've known that didn't think that they deserved it. They've earned it, they've done it, and it builds pride in their life. Don't let that happen to you. Don't be proud of the things you have, because anything you have that's of any value came from God. It was a gift. So the Spirit of God moved Paul to warn Timothy to instruct others, those who have the riches that they should not fix their hope on uncertainty of riches, but on God. That's what it says in 1 Timothy 16, 6, 17. Humility, which is the opposite of pride, on the other hand, is a gateway to all of God's blessings. The reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Proverbs 22, 4. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. James 4, 10. We are unable to save ourselves, like I just said. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that not of your works, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. So God met the greatest need and provided for the greatest need in our lives. Salvation. Reconciliation with him. The paradox is that while we, the disciples of Jesus, are to be poor in spirit, we don't live in need. Okay? That whole dictionary definition goes out in our lives. Being poor has nothing to do with need in our lives. Being poor in spirit. Being poor in spirit is not so much about what a person has as what a person considers to be his own and understanding the source of it. Okay? <clears throat> Rarely have I ever met a rich Christian who didn't think that he was the source. You know, that he earned, well, I'm going to tell you something. 
regardless, if you are being led by the Spirit of God, everything that you have, everything that you are, you owe to the Lord God. He is responsible for it. I, I've shared this, I think, or mentioned it a number of times. I used to have a, I meet with a, a friend of mine who was a very successful real estate broker. And we'd have a bagel and a cup of coffee together in the morning, and my wife Alice would go with us. And I don't know what led up to it, but I had a conversation with him, and I said to him, you know, it boils down to this. You have to come to an understanding of ownership, stewardship, and possession. Those are three different things. You see, whatever it is, whatever it may be, it's not yours. It's not yours. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell in it. Psalm 24, 1. Everything in the world belongs to God. He is the owner. The Lord created the earth and gave man stewardship. That is, he gave him, and he gave him dominion and authority, right? And possession. Put him in the garden to cultivate the garden, right? But he didn't give him ownership. So Adam went into the garden, and he had, he had possession of it, and he had authority over it. He had stewardship for it. He was responsible to cultivate it. But God still owned it, which is why he had the right that when Adam was unfaithful in the contract, the covenant, he could evict him. You don't want to get evicted. You know, I'd like to share an example. I think I may have mentioned this a few times before. A number of years ago, Alice and I lived in Lake Mary, Florida. And we were renting a, an apartment there, and we've been there for a couple of years. I, I really don't remember. And um, we were headed up to New York to minister, <clears throat> and our lease was coming due. And God spoke to me and told me, "Don't renew it." Now the, the deal is in the in that apartment, you had to let them know in advance whether you're going to renew the lease or not. So we were getting ready to leave for New York, which is like almost about 1,300 miles away. And it was the dead of winter. I think it was it was December. And I went to the office and I told them we were not going to renew the lease. And I told Alice, we're not going to renew the lease. And I think she said to me, so what are we going to do? I said, well, God told me what not, not to do, but he didn't tell me what to do. So we, we got to do some serious praying on this trip. So we got up to New York and it was bitterly, bitterly cold. This was in upstate New York, like I said, in, in December. As a matter of fact, it was exceptionally cold. Because when we got there, I mean, it was my habit, we, we ministered there quite a bit, that there were a number of guys that got together on Wednesday mornings, early, early Wednesday mornings, and had a little time of prayer together. And I would always go to that with the dear brother we stayed with, Bob Rizzoni. So this one Wednesday morning, and it was like 15 below zero. I mean, it was bitter, bitter cold. So Bob and I went over to the prayer meeting. And there was only one other fellow there. Nobody else showed up because of the weather. And we were praying. We had a time of prayer. And one other fellow said to me, is there anything you would like prayer for? <laughs> and I said, yes, actually, there is something I need prayer for. I said, God, I, we didn't renew our lease down in Florida. <clears throat> so when we go back, we're going to have to, we don't have any place to, I mean, we're going to have a place to go for a few days, but then we don't have any place to go. So I need to pray and find God's will. What's going on? He said, we're going back to, we're going back to the Orlando area with, with no place to live. And the only other fellow there besides Bob looked at me and he said, you know what? He said, I just bought three condominiums down in Orlando to use this rental property to try and make some income. He said, would you like to do something? He said, would you like to just kind of manage those for me? And you can have a discount on your rent. So we wound up going, agreeing to that. So we had an apartment down there that was much nicer, much bigger. And it was uh, either the same or less rent. But the deal was that I had to, I, we had one apartment for ourselves. And the other two, we rented out on the seller's behalf and collected the rent every month for him, and banked it for him. See, that's a really good example. Because of the three the three condominiums, the three apartments, let me say, Alice and I had possession of one. 
but I had stewardship for all three. I was responsible for the stewardship of all three units. But in no time did I own any of them. The fellow in New York still owned them. You see, it's like you go out and you get a rental car. You can have possession of the car, and if you have possession of the car, you have a certain, you have a responsibility for it. You have stewardship of it, but you don't have ownership. A lot of people don't understand this. It's about, you know, is it better to own something or just to have stewardship over it? Well, you don't have the, there's, there's, there, I, I can remember there was a phrase that was used about the pride of ownership. But there's also a truth about the burden of ownership. So to be able to have something to use it and care for it and not have that burden of ownership can be a real blessing. Okay? God has to pay the taxes. <laughs> okay. It all belongs to the Lord our God. Think about this. Even you don't belong to you. Paul wrote, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. You're not your own. That's exactly what the Word of God says. You've been purchased with a price. Being born in spirit is first and foremost about establishing the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our hearts. We can quote the scripture and sing the song from Psalm 118, verse 24. I'm sure you all know it. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. But if he made it, he owns it. We're only entrusted with it, stewards of our time. And that makes us responsible for what we do with it. Think about that. And that's important. In order for his teaching to make sense, we need to understand that Jesus is Lord of all. Our money, our families, our time, our jobs, everything. He is Lord of everything in our lives. Okay? And every place that he has that ownership, we are responsible to him for how we use it, from whom much has been given, much is required. All too often we've been conditioned to hear the words poor or rich and immediately think and focus on money. That's not what it's about. But that said, if there's any bias in the word concerning money, it would seem to favor the less affluent. Because there seems to be a clear and present danger associated with riches. I mean, yeah, I want to read you some scriptures and you think about this. Two things I ask of you, do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I shall not be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. That's Proverbs 30, verses 7 and 9. And as I mentioned before, Paul wrote a lot about this, and he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 9, But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. Why is this so important? Because the error is so widely preached in the church by those who, like the apostle Paul wrote about to Titus, he said, For there are many rebellious men empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. Titus 1, 10 and 11. Now, if you don't recognize that that's true today, probably much more true today than it was. Have a little prayer time with the Holy Spirit. Before we look at these scriptures, which are just a sampling of many like them, I want to make it clear that having riches is not the problem. you got to understand that. And that's not what I'm talking about. The desire for riches is. The love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Right? That's what Paul wrote to Timothy. The love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. 1 Timothy 6.10 There's more teaching in the church about getting rich getting wealth, getting money, than there is about being poor in spirit. Why did Jesus think that was so important that he should start his teaching to his disciples with it? 
Is there a bias? So remember that when I and I mentioned this when Jesus started to preach, he came out and went to Nazareth. He talked about he came to preach. He was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. Okay? And then Matthew nineteen verses twenty three and twenty five, Jesus said to his disciples, "Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven." Again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, then who can be saved? Listen, if Jesus himself warned about this. The riches, how it can affect you, how it can infect you, you better be on your guard. Because in the world, that's the constant thing. How many books are written about how to get rich? How many seminars are there about how to get rich, how to get more money? How many preachers are out there about how you can get more money, get more? Be on guard. Then in Mark chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, and this is that parable of the sower and the seed. And others are the ones whom the seed was sown, on, on whom the seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word, but the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. I, I know that I've shared it a number of times. You know, uh, a few years ago, Alice and I were having lunch with some friends, all who were, were, were wealthy Christians. But they were felt faithful, wealthy Christians. And they were financial counselors. And uh, we were having lunch together, and one of the fellows made the comment, well, you know, uh, the world, money talks. And I said, I know. I said, Jesus said the same thing. He, he looked at me and said, what? I said, Jesus said money talks. He just says that it lies. Bear that in mind. Luke six twenty four. But woe to you who are rich, for you're receiving your comfort in full. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited, or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasures of a good foundation for the future, so they may take hold of that which is life indeed. 1 Timothy 6, 17-19, because riches, that's not life indeed. Jesus said, even when a man has abundance, his life does not consist of his possessions. But there's a lot more I'd like to, to talk about. There's so much more in this. But you have to come to an understanding that everything in the world, and that's why, why do you think that Jesus spoke about this thing? No man can serve two masters. You have to be on your guard. And go read that sixth chapter of the, of the Sermon of uh, Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, and find out how dangerous it is. Because in the world, we are told everywhere and all the time that money is good. It's a good thing. You know what? Money is, is, is neutral. But the desire for money, the love of money, be on guard. Father, help us to be attentive to your spirit, to the leading of your spirit, to the, to the pleading of your spirit in our lives, to the, just that sense of what's pleasing to you. Lord, help us to seek your approval in all that we do rather than seeking riches. Help us, Lord God, to be used by you and show others in our lives and through our lives that there is abundance because you said that you came that we might have life and have it abundantly. But it's not about stuff. It's about love. And your love knows no bounds. So we praise you and thank you in Jesus' precious name, Father. Amen and amen. Well, I'm going to talk a little more about this when we get back together again next week. So be back. Share this with others. We love you and we pray for you. Pray for us. God bless you. Thank you.
my cup.